There's a lot of people who are out there grabbing anything and everything. They've never stopped to figure out what is it I really need, that I really want, that's worth pursuing. There's another song that's been playing for months now. The tune's kind of catchy. But two or three weeks ago, I, the words grabbed my attention. It's a Kelly Clarkson song. Let, let me read just a few of the I won't try singing it. Just a few lines. Her song says, I don't need you to tell me who to be. Can someone just hold me? Don't fix me. Don't try to change a thing. Can someone just know me? Because underneath, I'm broken. And it's beautiful. I'm broken and it's beautiful. I'm broken and it's beautiful. And on and on she repeats that over and over again, as if trying to convince herself that brokenness is beautiful. And I thought, that's so much the spirit of our age. Mm -hmm. Trying to find beauty in brokenness. Mm -hmm. Now, I give her credit for her self-awareness. She recognizes that like the rest of us, there's brokenness in her life. Some people don't realize that. They're just on the treadmill and don't realize some of the brokenness that's happened in their lives. So I give her credit for the self-awareness. Instead of whenever someone says, Hi, how are you? Saying, I'm fine. Everybody's fine. Well, not everybody's fine. There's a lot of brokenness in your neighborhood and mine. In fact, I think we've all suffered some brokenness somewhere in our lives. Whether we're victims of abuse, whether we've had a broken heart, whether we've been in an accident, or suffered depression, whether a, a spirit of rage or bitterness or despair has gripped us, or an addiction, or, or, or a, an out of control temper, or confusion over gender, or confusion over sexuality, or shattered dreams, or divorce, or there's a lot of brokenness in Canada, in Ottawa in our homes, in our lives, in our family circles. We're all in this brokenness together because we live in a broken world. That's a fact, Joan. We live in a broken world. Canada's a great place to live. But there's a lot of brokenness. Back in my student days, back in the 70s, Anybody remember the 70s? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they came out with a book entitled, I'm Okay, You're Okay. Oh, yeah. And it caught on like wildfire. Everybody was using that phrase. Oh, yeah. It was about accepting yourself for who you were, even if you weren't athletic, even if you didn't make good grades in school, even if you had diabetes or red hair. Accept yourself for who you are. You're okay. It was also about accepting others, even though they're different from you. Have different strengths, maybe speak a different language, or a different colored skin, or different religious beliefs, or, or a different lifestyle. It was about tolerance and acceptance of others who aren't good at what you're good at. Or don't think the same way. And I guess these are good things, accepting ourselves and accepting others. But what it led to was, if I'm okay and you're okay, then I don't need to change 
and you don't need to change. So if I eat a unhealthy diet, so what? I'm okay. And if I take too many drugs or drink too much, hey, I'm okay. And if I'm a compulsive shopper and spend too much, that's just the way I am. Don't try to change me. I don't need to change. I don't need to get better. I'm okay. And that thinking has led us to Kelly Clarkson's song. I'm broken, but it's a beautiful thing. I don't want to change. I don't need to change. How many know the devil is a deceiver? He's a big, fat liar. And he's a destroyer. Does the devil want us to find healing for what's broken? Does he want us to find wholeness and victory and liberty? No. His goal is to keep us in the dark, to keep us in bondage, to keep us in slavery. He wants to take away people's hope. He wants us to settle, to become complacent, to accept our brokenness as normal. And so the devil whispers in our ear. He says, you're stuck. You're trapped. There's no way out. There's no one to help you. You'll always be sick. You'll always be angry. You'll always be depressed. There's no hope for you. So accept it. You're broken. Isn't that beautiful? That's what he says. And then he grins the most sinister thing. The devil doesn't want us to get better. He doesn't want us to get free. He doesn't want us to be whole. So he continues to tell us his lies. If, if brokenness was beautiful, they would never have invented Gorilla Glue. <laughs> we hate it when things are broken, right? We try to put it back together before mom finds out. We broke her favorite vase. Yeah. Broken is not beautiful. Let's look at one Bible story to illustrate what Satan is up to. In Acts chapter 16, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to it. I think we have Sandy to read it for us this morning from her home in Manatee. Acts 16, beginning at verse 16. Over to you, Sandy. I'm reading from Acts 16, verses 16 to 20. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. In verse 16, Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke, are on their way to prayer meeting. Where's prayer meeting held in Philippi? Anyone remember? Don't you remember? Paul found Lydia and her friend down by the river, out, just outside of town. That's where they held prayer meeting each day. So I'm guessing that Paul and Silas and their friends are heading out of town, going to the river, to meet others to pray. Verse 13. 
Tell us about those prayer meetings. Well, while they're on their way, they meet a slave girl who is demon-possessed, empowered by the spirits to tell people's fortunes. She made good money from fortune telling. She just didn't get keep the money because she was a slave girl. And so her owners took all the profits. My heart goes out to this young lady because she's in double bondage. She's a slave to the evil spirit that controls her and she's a slave to her owners who have bought her and now treat her as property, showing no respect. This woman's life is badly broken. Whether she realizes it or not, this is not normal life. This is not healthy. This is not good. This is not what God wants for this young woman. She follows the apostles around town for several days, probably hoping to cash in on the crowds that gather to hear Paul preach. But in verse 18, after several days of being followed by this slave girl and her demon, Paul could stand it no more. He could not watch this tormented young woman, the slave girl, being taken advantage of. So he turns and he speaks, not to the slave, but to the demon within her. And he commands the demon to leave this broken woman in the name of Jesus. And you know, the demon had no choice but to flee and never return. In the name of Jesus. God fixed what was broken in that young woman. But the slave owners, they looked at it rather differently. They did not think this was a good thing. They thought Paul broke their slave girl. She could no longer tell fortunes. She could no longer serve as a medium. Have you noticed that whenever a fortune teller, a sorcerer, a medium has the demon cast out of them, they can no longer do their craft. Now, in our day, if Paul had done that here in Canada, He'd be in trouble. Because Canada has a new law. If we try to help someone who is confused about their gender or their sexuality, we can be arrested in Canada for trying to help someone find healing for their brokenness. Because brokenness in Canada has now been defined as something beautiful, as okay, as good. Guess what? Paul was arrested in Philippi too. For the same kind of thing. Right. Bringing liberty and healing to a young slave. For setting free a tormented soul. For ridding her of, his, of her demon. Which you think is a good thing. Right. But the slave owners didn't think so, and neither did Satan. Satan wants to keep people broken, because people with broken lives are easier to manipulate, yeah. easier to abuse, easier to take advantage of, easier to deceive. The devil doesn't want his handiwork undone in the name of Jesus. In Philippi, just like in Canada today, the authorities don't seem to want people to get well. 
especially if it goes against economic interests or political interests. Those with money don't want the broken seeking help. And the devil doesn't want Christians offering help to those who are trapped or broken. So they try to convince us that broken is beautiful. But you tell me, when a guy is forced to sleep in a park, exposed to the elements and the public, I know some people will say, leave him alone. That's what he wants. He wants to be there. Friends, believe me, nobody wants to sleep on a concrete sidewalk or in a tree, exposed to the public and the weather. Brokenness is not beautiful. You know, sometimes people have brothers or a mother whom they haven't spoken to in 10 years. The relationship is broken. And some people will say, no problem, you're better off without them, just forget about them. Move on. You don't have to fix your broken relationship because brokenness is beautiful. Guess what? It's not healthy. There is healing. There is hope. There are so many examples in the Bible of people living broken lives. The, the woman at the well, whose heart had got broken over and over and over and over again. Did Jesus leave her the way he found her? No. He healed her heart. He gave her hope and a future. What of the wild man who was living among the tombs, possessed, not in his right mind? Did Jesus leave him the way he found him? Of course not. There's nothing nice about being broken and alone without hope. We have all experienced brokenness in some big or small way. Relationships, shattered dreams, sickness, broken hearts. How does Jesus respond to our brokenness? He offers healing and deliverance and redemption and salvation and victory and wholeness. Jesus came to restore what is, has been broken. But Satan wants to keep us in our brokenness. Psalm 147 says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Isaiah 61, God has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives. And in John 10, Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Friends, brokenness is not beautiful. But brokenness is an opportunity for something beautiful to happen. It's an opportunity for God's love to heal us. An opportunity for God's amazing grace to restore us. An opportunity for God's power to be released in us when we give our brokenness to Jesus. You and I, we can't fix what's wrong with us. Like Humpty Dumpty before us, no amount of super glue can put the pieces of our broken lives or our broken hearts back together again. But God can.
when we give him the pieces. I, I don't know why it is. But we tend to hold on to the broken pieces in our life more tightly than anything else. Maybe it's because we're, we're ashamed of our broken pieces. Or maybe we're afraid that the pieces will get broken even smaller if we let go of them. Very familiar. It would be, yeah. Huh. Weird, but familiar anyway. God cannot heal our broken pieces as long as we're holding on to them. But when we surrender them to Him, when we give Him permission to dig into the most broken, darkest parts of our past, of our thoughts, of our hearts, He can heal. He will give us beauty for ashes. Yeah, I know I'm far from perfect, but I praise God every day that I'm not the man I used to be. God's been working in me, and God has been working in you. As much as we allow Him to, God has been at work since the day we accepted Jesus as our Savior, and especially since the day we surrendered our all and allowed and gave his Holy Spirit permission to work in our lives. You, every one of us is more like Jesus today than we ever have been before. Not because we're so good, not because we've been trying so hard, but because God's Spirit has slowly been working a good work in you. And He wants to continue that good work as we surrender more and more pieces to Him. Think back with me. You've known some amazing saints in your life. Think back to some of them. Some of the great loving, caring believers that you have known through the years. Whose lives were beautiful because of God in them. Some people come to mind, don't they? Beautiful people. Full of compassion. Humble. Gentle. Self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit you remember seeing in them. Because holiness is beautiful. Not brokenness. Holiness. When you and I surrender our lives to God, when we give Him permission to change whatever He wants to adjust in us, when we give him permission to use us however he wants to use us, and we lay our all on the altar, the Lord begins to quietly restore, to quietly heal our pain, our brokenness, reshaping our hearts and our thoughts and our lives. Ever since we surrendered to him, God has been renewing us using hardships and trials, persecution, illness, conflict, whatever it takes to prune us, to equip us, to make us holy, to make us like Jesus. It's not easy work, but the results are beautiful. The beauty of holy. Take a moment to think about some of the brokenness in your life that God has healed, that God has restored. You gave him the broken pieces, you gave him the broken relationships, 
You gave him your broken heart. And what? God did the rest. We don't have to fix our brokenness. God will do it. All we have to do is give him the pieces. You know, God doeth all things well. And God makes something beautiful out of the pieces of our lives. If we don't let him. Instead of trying to cope with the brokenness in our lives, if we just let go of it and give it to him, he'll turn it into beauty. This morning, we're celebrating what God has done for us. His healing of our brokenness. We are rejoicing. We are so grateful that God has made something beautiful out of our lives. And you know what? He ain't finished yet. He's still working on me. Is he still working on you? But the result is going to be amazing. We cannot heal our brokenness. But on the other hand, there is nothing broken in your life or mine, or our relatives, or our neighbors, the people of our community and our country. There is nothing broken that God cannot heal. No matter how small the pieces, no matter how great the pain, no matter how far down we've pushed it, God can heal every bit. Amen? Amen. All we have to do is ask. All we have to do is turn it over to Him. Surrender our brokenness to the Lord and trust Him to restore. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we worship You. We adore You as our Creator and our Recreator who can take all the pieces of our lives and make something glorious, something wonderful, something beautiful. You can make us like Jesus. So we ask, we implore you, to work your amazing grace in the broken, hurting, painful areas of our lives. We surrender. It's such hard work trying to keep our pain and our brokenness under control. We're tired. So we give it away. We choose to give it to you. Whatever you want to do with it, Lord. We say yes to your will and to your way. When we think of the many ways that you have healed us in the past, we are overwhelmed with thanksgiving. And we give you all the glory for who we are today. We are your handy. Thank you, Lord, for defeating the work of the devil in our lives, setting us free, and restoring what he had broken. We give you praise and unending gratitude. Continue your deep, deep work in us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who laid down his life 
that we might be healed. That we might be saved. That we might be delivered. Thank you, Jesus. We have one more song, if you know it, Tina. It's something beautiful, something good. It's a gate or two. About how God takes those shattered dreams and makes something beautiful of them. He understands how deep the pain goes. He understands our struggles to deal with. But he's often make something beautiful out of our lives. We'll begin with the chorus. You probably all know the chorus. If you know the verse as well, sing along with me. Something beautiful. Something beautiful. Until one day we stand before your throne, blameless, perfect, because of your grace. May your love fill our hearts. 
May your spirit be upon us. Guide our footsteps. Teach us your ways. And let us be a blessing to one another. In Christ's name. Thank you again, Tina. Thank you, Tammy. And as we fellowship in the backyard today, I want you to look around and see the beauty that God has put in each other. You are beautiful because God is working in your life. He made you beautiful. God's wonderful. Yeah. God bless you.